my god this is a full house isn't it Steve you know how to pack in a crowd don't you so Andrew Jim thank you so much uh, thank you to the longevity forum for organizing this it's amazing that this organization has been going for six years and you know what you've achieved is quite incredible actually it's sort of I mean Jim has I mean Andrew's introduced himself Jim I think many of you know all of you know the businessman entrepreneur visionary I think it's a great initiative well done to you um, let me just say a few words about Altos I mean Altos um, I met Hal Barron the CEO in August this year and he used to be the CSO at GSK so he's looking after R&D and he set up Altos and he's recruited some absolute superstars it really is a phenomenal organization they're very much focused on cell health, cell resilience, uh, re cell rejuvenation as a way of treating disease, um, as a way of treating disability, and as a way of treating injury. It's quite remarkable. And if you look at their board, I don't see many companies, <coughs> excuse me, with four Nobel Prize winners on the board. I mean, they've got Yamanaka, Doudna, Baltimore, Arnold. I mean, these are amazing individuals, and it, it's a, probably a signal of the caliber of people that Hal's been recruiting. Now, talking about brilliant people, there are very few more brilliant than Steve, who's going to talk this afternoon or this evening. Now, Steve, as many of you know, was a professor at UCLA. He's now a PI at Altos. I thought he was still in San Diego, but he told me he's moved to Cambridge a few months ago, uh, which is fantastic, I think, for us in the UK. Um, but he is an expert in many, many areas. Biogerontology, clinical trials in, for anti-aging, uh, epigenetic biomarkers of aging, epidemiology, systems biology, comparative biology. Is there anything you don't do, Steve? And sort of, do you sleep at night? So, but Steve, as many of you know, um, in 2011 uh, introduced us to the uh, first epigenetic clock uh, for saliva. And then in 2013, a, a clock for uh, which was pan tissue, and then in 2021, a uh, clock which was pan mammalian. Now, he's going to talk about much of this stuff, I think, this evening. So I think his title is, well, it's up there, Epigenetic Aging um, in Mammalian Systems and um, Rejuvenation Strategies. So, Steve, many, many thanks. I understand there's not going to be questions, but Steve's just going to wow us with loads of great signs. So, Steve, many thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm really honored. Um, thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, when I was um, 17 years old, I was in high school, and um, we had a guest lecturer at my high school. And this person gave a talk um, that deeply um, inspired me. And the talk was a, about something I had never thought about, which is aging. You know, um, I mean, as a 17-year-old, you really don't think about aging. Um, and um, his talk um, proposed this idea of how we could defeat aging. And it was based on the theory that we age because of radiation. That was the premise. And um, I mean, he, then you say, what kind of radiation is he talking about? His theory was that it's cosmic radiation, you know. <laughs> and um, um, some people may remember in the 1970s there were companies that sold you a lead suit. Basically, you slept in a lead coffin, you know, and, and um, I wish it was that easy, right? We would have a lead coffin sleep in it and uh, we'll live um, uh, maybe 50 years longer, you know. But, I mean, he was, of course, entirely wrong, but it, but it was a beautiful theory. But more importantly, 
ever since I was very interested in that topic, you know. Um, today, I won't talk about cosmic radiation. Um, we have a new theory. Um, there are many, many theories why we age, and um, I wouldn't say there's only one reason why we age, you know. But um, today, I will talk about the idea that maybe these epigenetic changes um, is, uh, in our DNA um, drive aging. And many of you is, know is that DNA has um, these four bases, A, C, T, G, and one of these uh, bases, the letter C, gets chemically modified. That's called methylation, you know. But there are many other chemical modifications, and it's all broadly known as epigenetics, you know. And um, now, my, um, because I was very inexperienced, um, I, um, my training um, was, um, in certain ways, led in uh, orthogonal directions. So after I graduated from high school, I studied math and physics, you know. And um, that's, of, um, of course, nowadays, if you want to study longevity, aging, you choose different fields, but I just want you to know. Um, um, anyways, by, by training, I'm a mathematician, physicist, but then I retrained as a biostatistician. So I'm a computational person by training. But nowadays, half of my lab um, consists of molecular biologists. Um, and um, the message here is perhaps that um, Learning is really a lifelong process, you know. I mean, I, every five or ten years I have to learn entirely new fields, you know. And so even if you get things wrong, you study theoretical physics, for example, and <laughs> you, can, you can just change into another field, you know. So anyways, um, so today I'll talk about epigenetic clocks and maybe some rejuvenation strategies. And, um, so the clock, um, maybe before I start, uh, what is a clock? Well, it measures the ages of your organs, and the picture captures the essence. So we want a molecular marker that measures the age of your skin, um, the, your liver, your kidney, your blood, and so on. And um, some of you will have heard of telomere length, for example, you know, so telomere shortening. But telomere sh uh, length is, a, is really a bad clock um, for a variety of reasons. But the idea is beautiful, that um, the, the DNA, a property of the DNA, telomere length, um, measures aging. And um, it, um, it turns out it's not telomere length, it's other changes, epigenetic changes. Um, so this is all motivated by trying to um, estimate this biologic age. Um, everybody knows that, um, has an intuition about biologic age. Your biologic age is your innate age. It's, it's a property that's different from your calendar age. Um, and it relates somehow to your mortality risk. But how to measure it? How to define it? And um, it hasn't been solved. Um, the, the field is struggling. When you um, assemble three aging researchers and ask them to define biologic age, you will get three different definitions. You know, um, Everyone has their own definition. Um, and um, but how would you go about measuring it? Well, on the right-hand side, you see various measures of organismal fitness. Um, for example, you could measure heart rate or um, your lung function or muscle strength and uh, cognitive abilities. So functioning of your organs, Fitbit or something. And um, there are many such devices out there. Another approach is the top. This is really um, what people study in tissue pathology. They look at senescent cells, they look at um, fibrosis, or what have you. And, um, 
At the bottom, you see the genomics revolution. You see um, transcription, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, glycomics, and I will talk about methylation. And all of these approaches that I describe have been used to develop various clocks, you know. And in certain ways, um, um, there is a big confusion about which clock is best, and it really depends on the application. But what is very exciting, and perhaps the next step, is to relate these clocks. What is the relationship between a methylation clock and a proteomics clock, or a, a, a metabolomics clock? What is the relationship between methylation clocks and measures of tissue pathology? You know? So correlating these and um, understanding the um, causal relationships, that's really of great interest. Now, in our field of aging, we are fortunate with respect to one thing. We have a gold standard variable, and that's, of course, chronologic age. Because if you have a biomarker that does not correlate with age, then it is simply not a biomarker of aging. You know? It's a biomarker of something else, but just not aging. And so um, one needs to distinguish um, clinical aging indicators versus molecular markers. Um, for example, it, let's say you have an, an obese person and this person already exhibits certain uh, manifestations of disease. Um, but is this person now older, biologically older, yes or no? Um, I won't say I have the answer because it's a definition game, you know. Um, so, some biomarkers and uh, many of my clocks will say an obese person, yes, is epigenetically older, but other biomarkers won't say it. And, um, but I can't say which is which. It, it's all about definitions. But there's one part of the definition of a biomarker of aging that everyone agree with, and this is that a biomarker of aging must predict the future onset of age-related conditions and do so independent of chronologic age. It must predict something. Uh, for example, all what is known as all-cause mortality. I don't know what is your cause of death, but I, let's say I can predict roughly when you will die. That, that would be a good biomarker of aging. And um, now I've developed axioms for biomarkers of aging, and I use the word my axioms not because I'm grandiose, but rather that these are, um, it's, do not assume we have consensus on those, you know. Um, each of these axioms can be debated. But in my own research, I use these axioms. So first of all, um, when you have a, bi let's take any biomarker you can think of, the amount of gray hair. Um, that biomarker correlates with age, clearly. Um, but axiom number two is, it needs to be connected to mortality risk, um, independent of age. And that's where it fails. There are plenty of people who are in, have gray hair, but they live another 60, 70 years, you know. So it would violate that axiom. Um, the third axiom I have is, it should um, measure a fundamental characteristic of most cells. Not all cells, but most cells. Um, and the reason is that most cells undergo aging. And um, so the, and that's why I like, of course, the DNA molecule. Um, for me, the DNA molecule um, is not just the carrier of genetic information, but it also carries information on time. And um, so um, here I show you a DNA molecule, um, uh, and um, you see um, these lights. They represent these methylation groups that attach to it and um, at the letter C. So it's known as cytosine methylation. And without cytosine methylation, um, a, 
a zygote could never develop into an embryo. You need uh, methylation for maintaining cellular identity. It's crucial in development of all vertebrates. All vertebrates have cytosine methylation. And um, the novel insight and the, uh, is, well, cytosine methylation also correlates very strongly with tissue dysfunction. So it's the opposite of a development. Um, but before I go there, I want to um, mention the fourth axiom. And this is arguably the most controversial axiom, which is that um, a biomark of aging should apply to all mammalian species. I should be able to measure the age of a mouse. I should be able to predict mouse mortality risk. And um, why is that? Well, because all mammalian species age. Um, that's an axiom. And um, so it would be nice to have that. You know? Now, I'm, I mentioned cytosine methylation because you can easily build biomarkers that satisfy these four con uh, axioms. You know? uh, conversely, the challenge for you in the audience is, can you use other readouts that satisfy these axioms. Would be nice to have a proteomics clock. There are people in the audience who uh, develop proteomics clocks. But anyways, if you can think of another readout um, that satisfies these axioms, that would be very exciting. Um, yeah, so DNA methylation allows you to build biomarkers with these three extraordinary properties. First, they apply to the entire life course. What does that mean? It's not just aging, it's also development. We can apply epigenetic aging markers to prenatal samples, uh, prenatal brain samples. Then the second property I, um, is you can build a biomarker that applies to all tissues. You know, um, Why is that remarkable? Because if we look at other clocks, for example, um, a proteomic clock, many people use blood plasma for it, and it works beautifully in blood plasma, but this same clock will not apply to brain tissue, just why different proteins would be involved, you know. So going from one tissue or cell type to another is already very hard for most biomarkers. And um, the third remarkable property of uh, cytosine methylation is that you can build these pan-mammalian clocks, these biomarkers that measure aging in all mammalian species. So for the quantitative people um, in the audience, I want to mention that um, epigenetic clocks are defined as a prediction method. Um, so you um, what is a prediction method? For example, linear regression is a prediction model. And um, more generally, in, um, in your um, biostatistics or statistics classes, you will learn many prediction methods. And the computer science people will uh, call them machine learning approaches. You may have heard artificial intelligence, neural network, all of that you can use neural network to build clocks work. So anyway, um, it's, um, all of these make predictions. And then the estimated age is fundamentally the predicted age. So for example, if you give me a blood sample or a saliva sample or any other source of DNA, I generate methylation data and then I predict your age based on the methylation data. And um, today I will start with biomarkers for humans and then later uh, move to other species. Um, so the biomarkers here, the blue curve on, on the graph actually shows you how methylation changes across the human lifespan. So at age zero, and, and I want to be precise, certain locations have that pattern. But um, initially there's this rapid increase during development, and then later, after age 20, roughly after you're a grown-up adult, then um, most uh, or certain locations show this linear behavior, you know. 
And so, although the epigenetic, many people don't realize it, but most epigenetic clocks use a non-linear transformation of methylation. Oops. Oh, sorry. Um, so, we have a clock that measures your mortality risk, and for the lack of a better name, we call it grim age, as in the grim reaper. And um, I challenge everyone to come up with a better name because we tried for two years, so. <laughs> um, anyways, so this grim age, how did we build it? Well, typically we use blood samples from, um, uh, that were collected 30, 40 years ago. There are these so-called epidemiological cohort studies and they collected blood samples in the 1990s or so. And then um, they put them in the freezer and forgot them. But 30 years later, we know what happened to the people. We know whether they're still alive or if they died, what did they die from. And so therefore, you can use these uh, retrospective studies to train your prediction methods. You, uh, um, and so we predict time to death, for example, using a regression model. And that, that predictor um, uses as covariates uh, methylation, the cytosines. Typically, a clock looks at several hundred locations on the DNA. You know. um, so Grim age um, predicts time to death but the methylation profiles underlying grim age have a nice interpretation. For example, at the bottom, you see something called DNA methylation smoking pack years. So it turns out um, cytosine methylation very much tracks how much you have smoked. Um, so for example, you could say, oh, I've smoked cigarettes for the last two years, five cigarettes a day, this, and you can quantitate it. Um, and report it to an epidemiologist. But it turns out the methylation levels in your blood um, capture that. I could, I could tell you, oh, you've been smoking, you haven't been smoking, you know, it's so remarkable. But anyways, so one of these, uh, this is one of the ingredients of Grim Age. It measures smoking. Um, other um, part, um, aspects measure um, your kidney functioning, so these are um, inspired by proteins, actually. Um, the Grimage clock is 100% based on cytosine methylation, but the experts in the um, audience will see um, some of these measures, cystatin C levels or um, hemoglobin A1C levels, um, because um, all of these pr uh, plasma-based proteins affect the methylome. Oops. So I always present Grim Age because it has been carefully validated by the large research community. Pretty much every human epidemiological cohort all over the world um, has methylation data, and you can just easily verify things. And um, so um, here I just show you a couple of citations. Um, I should say, when, um, so what is a grim age measurement? Let's say you give me your blood and assume you're 20 years old. And if the grim age estimate says, well, I estimate you to be 25, it means your grim age is five years older than your chronologic age. And that would then indicate that something ages faster in you. Maybe you've been smoking way too much or what have you, you know. Um, and um, so um, Grim Age, um, well, I think, um, so let's, I want to give you a sense of the predictive accuracy of the Grim Age. Let's say you do a Grim Age test, and the Grim Age test says you are eight years older than you should be. That's really, which means you're among the top 5% fastest agers. Let's hope you're not. But it would, it would then, um, the technical term is hazard ratio. It's 2.14. So this is the hazard ratio of death measures your instantaneous 
risk of dropping dead, you know. <laughs> so, and then it would say your risk of dropping dead in, in the coming year is twice that of the average person, you know, if you're in the top 5% fastest ages. I don't know. Um, conversely, some people are blessed and they are very young, according to Grim Age. Um, I recently did a Grim Age test and I was right on target, pretty much average. And for most people, that's, that's the result. Um, so, um, um, by the way, there are many companies by now that offer various epigenetic clock tests. And overall, I tell people, um, save your money, you know, because um, the problem is we don't have any treatments for any of that, you know. So let's say you are aging faster, what are they going to tell you? Eat more vegetables, you know. But I hope you already know that, you know. So, <laughs> it's, so in that sense, save your money. Um, but here I show you mortality risk curves, and each graph on the y-axis is the proportion of people who are alive, and on the x-axis you see years of follow-up. And so if we see, um, for example, in the Women's Health Initiative, in the lower middle panel, you see the blue curve are the top 20% people with the uh, slowest aging, and the red curve are the top 20% fastest ages. And you see pretty good separation, you know, independent of sex and, and so on. And I want to mention that although I keep talking about smoking, but Grim Age measures way more beyond smoking. For example, Grim Age would predict mortality risk in people who never smoked a single cigarette. Or conversely, if you are heavy, if you take a room of a hundred people, heavy smokers, Grimage would still stratify them, you know. And Grimage works in all racial groups. It works in men, women, you know. So it's um, quite robust in humans. And then epidemiologists and many others have used Grimage to see well what are benefits um, according to this readout, and. Um, the usual suspects eat vegetables, exercise, education a little bit, um, and you know um, the bad things you also know, don't smoke, avoid obesity, um, and, um, and above, uh, above all avoid diabetes and fatty liver disease. So all of this has been established, but it really required thousands of blood samples. So here I show you some numbers. For, um, for example, when we looked at exercise um, in the Women's Health Initiative, we looked at 4,000 postmenopausal women, and there the correlation with exercise was minus 0 0.1, 0.1. That's a weak correlation, you know. Um, but anyways, um, maybe, sorry, I want to show the very first row, which is mean carotenoid levels. What is that? Um, we can measure how many vegetables you eat, you know. Um, there is a blood test for it. And, um, and when um, we correlated this blood test of vegetable intake with Grim Age, you see a correlation of minus 0.27. To me, as a statistician, that's a strong correlation. And um, you should ask me what I had for breakfast today. Um, uh, most people here wouldn't do that, but I eat vegetables you know, for breakfast, which is tough. It takes inner strength. And so <laughs> uh, so um, I have a freezer full of frozen vegetables. So I drink my coffee, slam some frozen vegetable in the microwave, and that's my breakfast. You know why? It, it is beneficial. You know. <laughs> um, all right. Um, what about fatty? So you can measure fat content in various organs. And here I show you how um, Grim Age correlates with fat content in, um, in the liver and other organs. And basically, there is a, the expected correlation. If you have fatty liver disease of um, fatty organs, unfortunately, it is reflected in your blood methylone you know, as well. 
And here's the most surprising uh, correlation from a Scottish cohort, uh, Ricardo Marioni's team has shown that, that um, in this Lothian birth cohort, they, they measured, um, uh, first of all, they assessed cognitive functioning, memory performance, but then when um, the people passed away, um, they also, um, of course, did um, various assessments in the brain and also MRI of the brain. And basically, the, the blood test, grim age, correlated with brain volumes and cognitive functioning. Um, weakly, but statistically significantly. And um, for you, this may be um, not exciting, but um, for a scientist, that's very exciting because um, normally when you apply for research funding and you say, I will measure something in blood that is supposed to capture brain functioning, most scientists will say this is too risky a proposal, this will not work. But I show this here because um, methylation does capture some aspects of brain aging. So um, grim age um, stands out among um, several of the other clocks that I developed in terms of its uh, prediction of time to death, time to coronary heart disease, it even relates to time to cancer. And um, I briefly mention women who enter menopause early, um, their grim age is slightly elevated. Nothing to worry about, but slightly, you know. And um, so um, why use epigenetic clocks? Um, like, um, why not use much cheaper measurements? Let's say blood pressure. Basically, a blood pressure me measurement is, is um, very cheap once you have the equipment. It costs nothing. And blood pressure is, of course, very predictive of your mortality risk. Or um, d d frailty indices, how strong you are, or walking speed, all of that relates to your mortality risk. So why measure uh, methylation? Uh, well, because um, it probably relates to a root cause of aging. Coming to my introductory remarks, um, many of us believe that epigenetic changes are part of an innate aging process, you know. Um, and also you can apply epigenetic uh, clocks to cells growing in a dish, you know. Um, but yes, if you truly want to know how long you live, you need to talk to an, um, an actuary, uh, somebody who sells you a life insurance policy, um, because they are world experts on that. They will ask you 50 questions, and they can pretty accurately d estimate when you will die. You know, and it, um, So epigenetic clocks are part of this arsenal of biomarkers, you know, and, um, and let me briefly mention, sometimes I get an email because somebody did a, an epigenetic clock test and then their epigenetic age was much older than it should be and they are all freaked out. And um, they shouldn't be, you know, because epigenetic readouts are just one readout, you know. So it could be that somebody has an accelerated epigenetic age, but let's say... Um, their glucose levels and their blood pressure and everything else is in perfect shape, you know. So uh, you need to balance that information. Yeah. Okay. Um, one question I often get is, well, do epigenetic clocks detect the beneficial effect of exercise? So, for example, um, as um, we are close to New Year's Eve, and you probably think of your New Year's resolution, and you will say, I will buy a gym membership, and um, I measure my epigenetic age January 1, and then in July I measure it again. Well, will you see a difference, you know? And I would say for most clocks um, that we currently have, not really. I don't think so, you know. And, um, but this is an opportunity for um, the audience. I think one could develop methylation clocks that are um, more responsive to these lifestyle interventions, you know. And uh, so um, 
some, some of the clocks work already when we analyze a couple of hundred people. For example, I analyzed bodybuilders versus non-bodybuilders. And yes, we see a little bit of an effect, you know. But um, I just want you to know that. Um, so I want to now return to my... Um, or maybe before I move on, um, let's stop here and ask, do you guys have any question at this point about humans? Yeah. Yes? On the class, uh, what model is really based on? Is it yeah. like deep learning or...? Yeah, you know, it's not deep learning. It's simply a regression model. Um, you could think of it multivariate regression, and um, but to be even more precise, it's so-called Cox regression, um, so time to death uh, with sensor data. Mm -hmm. um, deep, um, we have tried deep learning, and there were no benefits, um, uh, and the re reason is perhaps because our sample size was too low. You know, for deep learning, you really want to have, I want to say tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of, or millions of data, whereas with smaller samples, um, the power of deep learning doesn't come out. I know. Mm. Yeah, please. So is developing a genetic clocks essentially a shotgun approach where you just look like, at various combinations of manipulation sites and then see which ones work best? Um, Yes, so the question is, is um, our epigenetic clock kind of randomly picking? And it's not quite random, but um, let me rephrase it. Um, so my, my pan tissue clock was based on 353 locations in the DNA. But there are actually 28 million cytosines in the human DNA. And um, out of these 28 million, I want to say a quarter of them actually change with age. It's, it's, um, so I could have picked many other sets. <laughs> and, um, um, so um, you could build so many different clocks. With, and um, it tells us one thing. The clocks um, really capture a property of the entire DNA, you know. It, I often call it global property, you know. So, but the other thing is, it's not entirely, I, I wouldn't use the word random, because when you build clocks, um, you can then do a bioinformatic analysis to see, well, where do they locate, you know. And um, they often locate, um, so the cytosines that gain methylation with age, they are often located in regions that matter in development, developmental genes, so-called bivalent uh, promoter regions, you know. So, um, so it's not, not entirely random. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? I just want to ask, apart from simplicity, what's the advantage of an epigenetic clock measurement as opposed to cellular biomarkers? Yeah, the question is, what is the advantage of an epigenetic clock over P16, P, or, P, um, um, or other biomarkers of cellular senescence? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it turns out, um, and it relates to the root cause of aging. Some people believe that we age because of senescent cells. And if you believe it, you shouldn't use an epigenetic clock, in my opinion. You should actually find ways to define cellular senescence, SASP or what have you, and measure that, you know. And conversely, interestingly, the, there, is not a, there isn't a tight connection between epigenetic clocks and uh, markers of senescence. To me, these are really too, um, to simplify it, assume that these are separate aspects of aging, you know. Um, I'm humming and hawing because on a deeper level there are connections and that remains to be studied in great detail. But superficially, they are not related. And uh, one way to see it is um, you can radiate cells and quickly induce senescence. But that treatment will not touch the epigenetic age, surprisingly, you know. And there are many different ways of inducing senescence, and um, uh, I, I'm not aware of any that actually correlates strongly, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes? Hey, um, I was quite surprised when you showed your big table of correlations between good age and various other markets. The LDL seemed to have absolutely no correlation at all, and obviously no cardiovascular problems are where the leading causes of 
from that. So you, your application account is trained on that. So you expect something to correlate really well with one thing because of that to correlate with it. Yeah, I need to dig out the slides because we hyperlipidemia. Um, interestingly, HDL cholesterol, do you see that? It's actually protective, do you see? Now I'm fully aware that this is not the science, you know, <laughs> um, because uh, drug companies have tried to raise HDL and there's no benefit. Um, but conversely, if you do look at triglyceride levels, right, there is a correlation, interestingly. Yeah, so this, um, so this highlights an important point. There's, there are many ways to die, and not all of them affect the methylome. Um, I give you an example. Somebody gives you a toxin, you are dead in a minute. It has no effect on your epigenetics. Um, you know, so, um, and that's why when I discussed the axioms, I, I very carefully worded it. I said it should correlate or relate to mortality risk, but, but not be the same as mortality risk, you know. And, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Understand you've shown very clearly correlation between actual changes and aging. Do we yet know whether these changes are a consequence of aging, or do they actively contribute? The yeah, that's a million dollar question, you know, and um, the good thing is um, there are now experiments that um, directly address it, you know. Um, I want to give you some answers, you know. So, if, oops, sorry, microphone. <laughs> um, um, when, we, um, when we ask the question, does epigenetics as as broad phenomenon. Do epigenetic changes cause aging or tissue dysfunction? I would say pretty much any aging researcher will say yes, you know. And we know that because of um, studies in model organisms, for example, you know, where they change um, certain histones and um, affect things. Um, but if you ask the question, does cytosine methylation, is cytosine methylation per se causal, you know, then um, the answer is um, probably most of the changes are not causal, you know, because remember I told you that millions of locations on the DNA change with aging, and my belief is most of them have zero consequence, you know. So in certain ways the question is, um, which part of the DNA, um, which cytosines are causal, you know, and there's the opportunity really to build a new generation of epigenetic clocks. So very carefully think about that question, which cytosines should be part, become part of the definition of an epigenetic clock? That's where the field is moving, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, yes? So uh, the age acceleration in the UK calculator is basically the difference between the predicted age from the uh, uh, prediction model and the chronological age. And you want it to be different there because if you develop a model which predicts 100% of the chronological age, there's no variation there and there's no distorted prediction. But you don't want the model to be too bad, like the answer of like 0.2 or 0.3, as that, that variation is simply the error of the model itself. The, uh, biological changes. Is there a balance or a threshold where you call it it's, uh, the difference is capturing the biological age uh, aging process instead of the models? Yeah, that, thank you for the question. Um, and um, you should say your name. Uh, what uh, is? Su Hao. Su Hao, he published a wonderful paper on a proteomics aging clock, so I invite you to look up his paper. Yeah, so um, the question relates to what is known as the paradox of biomarkers of aging. Everyone wants an accurate clock, but they don't want it to be too accurate, you know. And um, earlier today you discussed Hal Barron, who is now my boss at Altos. And the first time I met Hal Barron, I said, you know, Hal, you were CEO at another aging company. Why did you never use epigenetic clocks? And then, to his credit, he gave an honest answer. And he said, well, 
um, I, I had something to do with that. <laughs> he, he took a responsibility. He said, because the clocks were too accurate, they cannot possibly measure biological variation, you know. So, um, which is a funny comment, you know, because whatever you do, they will not like what you do. If it's not accurate enough, they will reject it. If it's too accurate, they reject it. But um, <laughs> the, this is based on a misunderstanding of the clocks, you know. When you have a very accurate clock, um, it depends on what age group, you know. So, for example, um, when I analyze, let's say I take people under 20, I would be able to pre um, estimate your age with an accuracy plus minus two years, um, I would say. Um, however, if I took people 60 plus, suddenly we get much bigger errors, you know. And the reason why initially epigenetic clocks or other biomarkers were criticized, they say it's way too accurate. Well, it was averaged over children and adults, you know. Because the minute you look at the 60 plus group, the opposite is the case. I would say our biomarkers are not, not accurate enough, you know which is another opportunity for future research, you know, build biomarkers that are very predictive of mortality risk in 60 plus or 80 plus, you know, um, and, and they're not too accurate. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, final question, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, a lot of diseases like obesity and talking about themselves genetic, and it's like the genetic component of it, but it's like the Oh, yeah. Um, so the question is, um, how much does, do, do epigenetic measurements add to genetic information? For example, some of you will have heard polygenic risk scores or just... Um, and there we do know the answer. Um, the answer is epigenetics adds uh, profoundly more information than genetics, you know. We know that because um, these human cohort studies that have measured SNPs, they also have measured methylation. You, you can really do a direct comparison, you know. And the answer is combining both is best, you know, but, um, but if you had to make a choice, then um, epigenetics would be far more predictive, you know. So, for example, um, I showed you grim age. I keep talking about it. Um, it predicts mortality risk. If, I, if conversely, we try to use genetic markers, SNP markers, polygenic risk score, I mean, it wouldn't even come close, you know. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. But interestingly, um, so um, polygenic risk score of human longevity do correlate with grim age, you know. So there's a, uh, and as you said, um, gene epigenetics is to, to some extent under genetic control, no question, you know, you, you can do these uh, methylation QTL studies, you know. So, so there's an interplay. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Um, there, there was a paper uh, many years ago where people um, reported in a very reputable uh, journal, which I won't name, that they can measure some SNP markers in a newborn and determine whether this person will become a centenarian, you know. And um, that, uh, that paper unfortunately had an error, you know, it di didn't work. So I don't think you will ever be able to use genetic information to predict whether someone will become a centenarian. But conversely, would you be able to use epigenetic information to predict centenarian status? Um, I am quite hopeful that this would be possible, you know. And the reason is that a lot of epigenetic uh, patterns are really already uh, established in utero and by the time you're born. So actually, I, I think there could be a signal, you know. I, this is now a speculation, but um, it needs to be seen, you know. Mm. Okay. Um, now, um, sorry, we need to move on. Oh, sorry, I skipped a slide. So coming back to axiom four. Um, it would be nice if a biomarker of aging applies to all mammalian species. and. Um, in order to address it, I spent seven years. 
and um, not alone, because this was work of 200 investigators all over the world, many in Britain. And we call it the Mammalian Methylation Consortium. And what took so long was a, a collection of samples. So um, in total, we generated methylation data from 15,000 tissue samples from 348 mammalian species. And um, these, um, when you have species, sorry, um, um, I learned that as part of the project. Every mammalian species belongs into one of 26 groups. They call it taxonomic order. And we got 25 out of 26 taxonomic orders. So there's one species, which is a bizarre species, um, and um, it's called the marsupial mole. It can only be found in Australia, and for the life of it, we couldn't get the DNA from it. So if there's an Australian here, uh, take a shovel in your backyard and bring me one. <laughs> <laughs> That's your, uh, your chance to become famous. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, but we have all the other orders. And, um, but also, as part of the project, we had to develop a new way of measuring methylation, um, a new uh, technology called the mammalian methylation array that can tolerate mutations. So here in the top row, we, the orange points show you cytos the cytosine we want to measure, and all the other letters are part of the DNA sequence, and the different species have mutations. So the mammalian array tolerates these mutations, and therefore it measures methylation in highly conserved stretches of DNA. So we look at 36,000 locations, and um, many of them are present in all mammalian species. Um, and um, I'm quite proud to say that we released all the data. All of you can download them. They are freely available. Um, so um, I, also the software, the entire software and everything is freely available. Um, you and your laptop can do an amazing job here analyzing the data. Um, so coming back to my own private passion, I like these epigenetic clocks. And we wanted to develop multi-species clocks. What is a multi-species clock? It's fundamentally a regression model that applies to all species. And it uses highly conserved cytosines. And um, it's one formula, um, one, no tweaking. As I could literally write down a math formula. Um, and let's start out with primates. Um, so 55 million years ago, primates evolved, really 10 million years um, after the asteroid impact wiped out the dinosaurs. I mean, amazingly quickly, primates evolved. And, but the point is, we are separated from other primate species by 55 million years of evolution. So um, what are the chances to build an epigenetic clock in humans that applies also to lemurs, you know? And, um, but it turns out this was a trivial exercise. It, it's very easy to do that. So here I show you on the x-axis um, the chronologic age. Each panel is a different species of primates. Y-axis is a so-called cross-validation estimate. This is an unbiased evaluation of our pan-primate clock. And But primates, you would say, oh, well, they are still related. So yes, it's feasible. But now let's come to another idea. Can we build um, a clock that applies both to rats and humans? Um, and this is um, tricky. Now, to do that, we make use of a mathematical trick, which is we define something called relative age. So we take the age of um, the sample, let's say you have a 61-year-old man, you take his blood, 
and then you divide it by the maximum lifespan of the species. The human maximum lifespan is 122 years, so a 61-year-old man will have a relative age of, of 0.5. And similarly, a rat, the maximum lifespan of a rat is four years, and so then the relative age of a two-year-old rat is also 0.5, you know. And so this mathematical trick, which is a trivial trick, but it aligns species, you know. And so here on the left panel, you see on the x-axis relative age, and on the y-axis the methylation estimate. And the green dots are the human samples, and the red dots are the rat samples. And you see one regression model predicts relative age in both species. And um, now coming to the most important question, well, can you build a pan-mammalian clock that applies to all species? And here I show you the work from um, the first author, Akelou, where we, on the right-hand panel, you see again on the x-axis relative age, and on the y-axis the predicted relative age, very high accuracy across um, a couple of hundred species. And this is somewhat of a miracle, you know. Uh, it shows that there's something deeply conserved uh, in the aging process, you know. Um, why do I mention it? Because um, in the past people thought aging is uh, similar to um, um, wear and tear. It's simply wear and tear, it's noise, it's random um, accumulation of noise, um, entropy increases. But this suggests that part of aging are conserved in all these different species across hundreds of millions of years of evolution. So uh, something meaningful is going on. And here I show you how this pan-mammalian clock applies to humans in the upper left panel, very accurate, mice, dolphins, wolves, bats, so uh, just remarkable. Um, here I show you a pretty picture that tries to make a point about accuracy. So the species are aligned according to maximum lifespan. The dashed line um, shows you the maximum lifespan of the species. And the jaggedy lines on the, in, uh, the outer rim show you the accuracy of the pan-mammalian clocks. And the point is, the accuracy doesn't look like a spiral. And the point is that accuracy does not depend on maximum lifespan, you know. Um, so what it means is, what, if you build a clock for a rat, it will be super accurate, and a rat lives less than four years. If you build a clock for humans, which is a very long-lived species, it will be equally accurate, you know. So epigenetic clocks, on, at that, the accuracy is um, disconnected from maximum lifespan. Um, which to me means something, and we'll discuss it later. Um, so we have these epigenetic clocks, uh, sorry, for many species. We have clocks for mice, for rats, for pigs, for dogs, primates, and it really ushers in a new era of testing interventions and, um, in, um, and then seeing uh, um, let's say you have an intervention that rejuvenates multiple primates, well, maybe according to such a clock, uh, such a pan-mammalian clock, well, maybe then it applies to humans as well. And so what have we learned? Um, so uh, mouse studies have shown that caloric restriction seems to slow aging in the mouse liver and several other organs. Um, then there are these dwarf mice uh, that age more slowly, and uh, parabiosis um, um, uh, also uh, rejuvenates us. And conversely, pro-aging high-fat diet or certain genetic conditions such as Down syndrome, trisomy 21. Um, 
So here I want to show you um, a very robust finding that has been robust in the sense many labs have shown it. Vadim Gladyshev, but many others have shown this finding that these dwarf mice, you see this dwarf mouse, this is a snell mouse, um, but when we look at the epigenetic ages of uh, different organs from these dwarf mice, they are much younger, liver, kidney, and so on. And um, so I went to my wife and said, I know how to ensure that our next uh, child lives much longer, you know. But she wasn't up for that experiment. But in theory, we know how to do that. <laughs> if you, um, the, um, these dwarf mice, it's one gene knockout, you know. We know the biology. So um, anyways, sometimes being a dwarf has, has real benefits, I should tell you. Um, this is a German ch a joke, it, it never were. It, it's, a, it's my cultural background, bad jokes. Um, but um, th there are many um, genetic uh, conditions that have been linked to either accelerated aging or decreased aging. Um, so here I mention certain um, disorders, Sotos syndrome, Tet and Brown, Raman syndrome has been shown by a UK team to be associated with accelerated aging and, um, and so on. So I, I want to mention it because I um, keep mentioning that developmental processes relate to epigenetic clocks. And that's one of the main insights of, of epigenetic aging studies, that developmental processes um, play a role in aging. To you, maybe a trivial insight, but it's, uh, in my opinion, profound. Um, why? Because development plays a purpose whereas aging doesn't have a purpose. So it's interesting that a purposeful um, process development later on may give rise to aging. Um, sorry. Um, so here I mentioned parabiosis, but I want to now mention um, an insight that's pretty recent, which is that cell-cell communication does affect epigenetic clocks. And you can see several different vignettes in the literature. Um, so what is cell-cell communication? Well, um, whatever goes through your blood plasma, for example, could be hormones, could be exosomes. And um, here I show you a very recent paper from Harold Ketcher and Rudy uh, Goya and um, Akshay Sangavi and Gordon Lauk and many authors where we investigated m male rats and we um, administered a treatment uh, fundamentally based on exosomes. Interestingly, exosomes extracted from pigs. So Harold Ketcher developed a treatment um, that he then applied to these rats. And what you want to do is to compare the red bar to the orange bar. In um, what you see is we start with rats that may be two years old, two year, two year old liver. And after we administer this E5 treatment, it's called exosome treatment, we see drastic epigenetic rejuvenation of multiple organs, blood, liver, heart, to a lesser extent, the hypothalamus, you know. And um, these results are so dramatic that I initially really s struggled even believing them, you know. But then, um, as I mentioned, there are several other people who have worked in that space. For example, here I show you a study of this parabiosis idea. You connect an, the circulation, uh, circulatory system of an old mice with a young mouse, and then you collect the organs two months later after you detach these mice, and they, you still see benefits, you know. So um, parabiosis has the expected effect. But I could show you, um, and here, I, let me finish with a human study. Uh, James Clement did a phase one clinical trial 
where he injected umbilical cord plasma, high concentrations of that into um, older adults, and um, Grimage was slightly rejuvenated, you know. So I see plenty of evidence in the literature that this young plasma idea and um, affects epigenetic age, you know. Um, okay, maybe I'll stop here. Um, any questions at this point? Yeah, go ahead. Can you tell us what happened when it was the most lifespan after that? Yeah, so that's a very... Um, um, oh yeah, you know the uh, yeah. L let me start with uh, yeah. I want to be, give you precise answers. So I'll start with this rat study. Um, there are unpublished data that show that this also extended the lifespan. As a matter of the fact, I think the Guardian or a newspaper wrote an article about the oldest rat that ever lived. I think the rat is called Sima, and that rat was treated with this E5 compound which is a stunning result. And then I have a collaborator, Rudy Goya, and he inject, injected young plasma um, also into rats and also observed the longevity effect, you know. And um, yes, so that's one answer. So one would think it has an effect. Um, when we come to parabiosis, the answer is a bit more complicated. Um, parabiosis, where you stitch together two animals, is actually quite stressful to the animal, and both have a shorter lifespan. But in that paper, they also showed an, a lifespan advantage. But I, um, to, um, yeah, anyway, um, and um, maybe um, I want to talk a little bit about history. There was an American scientist, I think, uh, McClive. Um, he invented caloric restriction. He was the same person who invented, quote unquote, heterochronic bi parabiosis. And he also used rats and also showed a lifespan benefit of, um, so it, these findings are quite old, you know. <laughs> they go back to the 1950s, you know. But what we now understand, see, in the past people just measured lifespan. Now we can look at the genomic biomarkers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, please. Yeah. 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 To go back to what you said about parallels between um, development and aging, in transcriptomics you see as an organism develops, you get increase in complexity um, in, and difference in differentiation between the cells and their transcriptomes. And then as they age, you see the convergence of information produced with individuality. Yes. I was wondering if you see the same type of thing in epigenetics and how that might affect the accuracy of the aging clocks. There's a stochastic Yeah, yeah, you are correct, you know, so um, um, many people interpret actually the changes that we see as um, entropy. Um, so, well, stepping back, if we think of methylation as a landscape, it's really mountains and valleys. There are certain parts of the uh, DNA that have lots of methylation and other parts have almost zero methylation, you know. And it's true, when you have a young cell, you have these pronounced peaks and troughs. But then, yes, as we age, this levels off. Everything becomes rather uniform, you know. And um, that definitely happens with aging, you know. So, um, and it, it, this phenomenon, and um, later I will show you some results that actually show that long-lived species, the naked mole rats, the bats, the humans, they maintain these valleys um, better, you know. So it's, um, whereas short-lived species, more uniform landscape, you know. And, um, but yes, um, I don't know whether it answered your question, but basically we see the same yeah. mm -hmm. as in transcriptome. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, there. Okay, there. Please, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I actually worked in the Asian field and I started with the medicine to develop like a clock based on tablets. So, uh, um, um, so it was actually inspired by the word age. So we tried to use the DNA presentation to develop the circuit markers from tablets and use those to predict age. So I was wondering, uh, so what's your opinion on using the DNA resolution as markers for the metabolites or proteins? Yeah, I'm 
mean, I, I think you are very fortunate that this is a very exciting project, you know. So at some point I um, looked at, l let's start with metabolites. At some point I saw some data and also in my lab we looked at it that show, yes, metabolites predict mortality, no question. And yes, you can build clocks based on them, you know. I never published it because our results were not good enough. Um, we didn't have enough data, you know. But um, um, the great advantage of metabolites is, is interpretability. You know, you immediately understand what's going on. And uh, so therefore it's a very worthwhile project. But it's also very exciting to um, build these correlates of met methylation correlates of metabolites. I just, I would say for m most of them you won't be able to do that, you know. There, but there might be some metabolites uh, that um, allow you to build a methylation surrogate, you know. So yeah, I think it's a super interesting project, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Um, please. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, the it, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> so um, it turns out that the best clock you could possibly build would aggregate information from multiple organs. Okay. So if we could dream, um, we would measure you, a skin methylation. We would do a fat biopsy, maybe a muscle biopsy. You know, we would collect all of that information. And in my opinion. And, you know, if it was easily collected, that's what I would do. Um, but then, as you indicate, the next thing extreme is, well, can we build, uh, can we use blood as a surrogate for these other tissues? And um, it depends a bit on the organ. So, uh, for example, um, I want to say the spleen uh, um, or, um, is very correlated. I've noticed that because I looked at many animals. I cannot distinguish the spleen methylation from blood methylation, you know. And so, um, so yes, some organs are more distant from other organs, you know. And, um, but quite a few groups are now trying to develop methylation-based biomarkers in blood that actually tell you your kidney is older, you know. Or, so it's a very active area of research. It looks very promising to me, you know. Um, um, yeah. Okay, final question here, yeah. please. Hi, I was wondering, do you see the same correlation with methyl transferase expression activity as you do with age? Um, I, so, f for example, DNMT, so DNA methyl transferases. Yeah, so that's a very important question. So DNA methylation gets deposited by certain enzymes or conversely removed by certain enzymes, TET. And um, then the question is, well, do we see changes in the activity of these enzymes one way or another, you know? And if you simply take uh, transcriptomic data, let's say from a public database, you, you probably won't see anything, you know. So on the mRNA level, you don't see that. Um, whether people have done careful um, enzymatic tests, I, I wouldn't uh, say so, you know. But um, more generally, um, the question is, can we find enzymes or upstream regulators, you know, that really, um, uh, explain the clocks, and many of us are working on that. I, I would say we don't have good answers at this point. That's why I keep talking about these genetic disorders. You know, genetics could teach us something. If, for example, somebody has a mutated DNMT3, you know, like in certain overgrowth disorders, you have these mutations, and sure enough, you see then epigenetic age acceleration, you know. So, um, to me, these studies teach us something, you know. But um, um, that's really the um, frontier right now. Which enzymes, what are the upstream drivers? Are there tr other, um, the TET and DMMTs, people call, uh, could call them worker proteins. They do the job. But what is upstream of them, you know? 
Um, that's unknown. Great. All right, moving maybe on. Um, now I talk about a different topic, maximum lifespan, not aging, not chronologic age. So we have the 348 um, species. By the way, is it 6.30? I, um, somebody stop me, okay? I don't know what the time is. <laughs> um, um, when sh what is the ending usually? If you have to go somewhere, I'm not offended. But um, if you're interested in how to live 200 years, maybe stay a few minutes. You know. But um, okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so humans truly stand out in terms among primates. You know, I think a gorilla, the oldest gorilla who ever lived, eight, died at 60. Um, and, but of course, there are other species. Bowhead whales live 211 years, if not more. And um, so, can we use methylation to predict the lifespan of a species? And the answer is here that on the log scale, the answer is yes. So, um, a doctoral student, Caesar Lee, developed this multivariate predictor on maximum lifespan. And um, so what it means is you, you go to the jungle, you give me a skin sample, you don't tell me the species. You just say, I found some skin. And, um, and then I will tell you this animal roughly lives up to 100 years. I, would tell you, I could tell you way more. I could tell you the gestation time, age at sexual maturity. Um, also the weight, uh, adult weight. The, so methylation captures a lot of species information. And, um, but now, um, see, maximum lifespan is very exciting to us because we are very aware of our own mortality. And, um, but I want, you, I want to emphasize that my view is maximum lifespan is truly set um, at birth, at conception, you know, it's a, um, and this, this will be the punchline of the next few slides, that it actually doesn't relate much to um, traditional risk factors. So, um, so we have a methylation-based predictor of maximum lifespan, and it's a biomarker, and what is it good for? Can we use it? And if you ask the question, you will first ask, well, does this methylation estimate of maximum lifespan correlate with chronologic age? And it really depends on the species. I would say overall weekly, you know. So here I show you, for example, in sheep blood, um, the lower panel, there is no correlation. Sometimes you see a slight positive correlation, sometimes in other species a negative correlation. So I would say overall maximum lifespan only weakly and ambiguously relates to chronologic age. <clears throat> Which makes sense because the maximum lifespan estimated in a newborn should be the same as the maximum lifespan estimated in a hundred year old. You're both the same species, right? It should be the same. Um, but you could more formally ask, well, does this ma predicted maximum lifespan actually relate to human mortality risk, time to death? And the answer is no, it does not. Or does it relate to smoking? And no, it does not. So everything I talked earlier about what you should do, don't smoke, exercise, you know, avoid obesity, all of these things that affect average life expectancy, right? the average life expectancy, all of that, but these factors do not affect the lifespan of the species. And um, the joke is, of course, that the oldest woman who ever lived, Jeanne Calmont, was a smoker, you know, <laughs> case in point, you know. So um, anyways, um, but there's one thing you can do if you want to extend your maximum lifespan. And this is shown here. In humans, females have this, we all know that women live longer than men. And the epigenetic biomarker shows that as well. So human females have this advantage in terms of maximum lifespan. 
Um, we looked at many species and only 18 species showed this female advantage. Um, okay, moving to the next topic. Um, remember we have tens of thousands of cytosines and you could ask, well, can you find individual cytosines that very strongly relate to maximum lifespan? And of course we did that. This is sometimes known as an epigenome-wide association study. And you can do that, and there are plenty of cytosines that correlate with lifespan. And some of them are um, located near Hox genes, again, developmental genes. Um, so um, keep re And here I show you um, the profile, the methylation landscape of the DNA. So the red curve, think of it as mean meth... Uh, uh, sorry, I want to get that right. The, no, the blue curve shows mean methylation across the DNA. In the middle you see a transcriptional start site. So at transcriptional start sites we have low methylation, then in gene body or intergenic region we have high methylation. That's what it shows. The red curve shows you what you want to have in a long-lived species. And so what it shows is what I said earlier. Long-lived species maintain this beautiful landscape of uh, valleys and peaks in the methylation, whereas short-lived species like rats, mice, shrew, um, have a flatter landscape. Um, I want to finish by some math. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, I'm a recovering mathematician, and I do remember a bit of calculus, rate of change, slope. All of you have seen that. So you, could, um, you can ask this question. If I have a rate of change in methylation at particular locations, does this rate of change relate to maximum lifespan? And um, the answer is a resounding yes. So here I show you on the x-axis um, log transformed maximum lifespan, and on the y-axis this um, rate of change of methylation. And you see this remarkable um, relationship. You know. um, but as I mentioned earlier, methylation has actually a nonlinear relationship with age. Um, so here I show you data from uh, pig blood where early in life you see again this fast increase in methylation and later of this leveling off. And so what you can do is you can define rate of change in young animals and meaning before sexual maturity and you can define rate of change in older animals. And what's the relation? And here I show you that relation. So um, the rate of the x axis is rate of change in uh, methylation um, in young animals versus that in old. You see a correlation, you know. Fast developmental speed correlates also to um, in, uh, fast increase of methylation later in life. And, um, but only in particular chromatin region. So for the people who like math, I want to say um, the methylation is a wonderful data set because there's strong signals for developing math formulas. Um, here I show you a curve how methylation changes um, in different species, but um, the mathematicians among you are challenged to really um, analyze this data. See, my dream was always to bring mathematics into biology, and after all these decades, I've completely given up on that. You know, um, biology is completely chaotic. Um, but if you want to go, then go to methylation. There, you can have a prayer of finding some laws. I would say, you know, and. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, um, the next frontier I want to mention is um, extending our mammalian project to other vertebrates. Um, I told you I worked for seven years on mammals. I'm deeply burned out. But uh, for some of you who have energy, built, an app, built 
clocks that apply to birds, bill of fish. I mean, these are very hard projects. They may not even be feasible, you know. What I know is um, birds and fish have cytosine methylation. So maybe one of you can develop a clock that applies to all of these vertebrates. I briefly mentioned we do have a, a clock for clawed frogs, the amphibians, you know. So that works. And um, so we have what we call an epigenetic clock theory of aging. Um, it basically says that methylation is a continuous readout of developmental processes and aging processes. And um, that's, um, so that's kind of the theory why we age, you know. And um, maybe I'll stop with the conclusions. You can use methylation to measure time. You can measure maximum lifespan. Above all, we have publicly available data. Hopefully, I inspired you to look at them. And here's my acknowledgement slide. Thank you so much.